The Story of Me is brought to you by Layuna Ontario Provincial District Council. Layuna, feel the power. Greetings. Our guest today can be best described as a founder and organizer of many worthy causes. A true unifying force behind important projects. His communities, the Canadian um, in general, and the Spanish-speaking uh, community in particular, are far richer due to his tireless work over the years. It's our pleasure to welcome Fernando Valadares. Hello, Fernando. Hola. <laughs> Hola. As we say in Spanish. <clears throat> it's been such a long time. I was thinking about this, coming to the studio, 30 some odd years that yes. I've seen you. We met a long time ago. That's right. When you so, were campaigning. Oh, <laughs> when I was campaigning. It was, uh, um, Yes. Uh, a bit, a bit younger at the time. Yeah. And it's such a pleasure to see you. Thank, Thank you for you. being here. Same. Thank you very much. Yeah. You know, it's funny because I always thought that you were from South America. And then I read your biography. You are from Madrid, Spain. Yes. I was born in Madrid yeah. in 1955. Yeah. Your father uh, was uh, in the agricultural business. Your mom was a homemaker. Yes. You have a brother? I have a brother. Yeah. Who is in Barcelona. <clears throat> Barcelona. Uh, now, at age four, yes. your mom had a stroke and became incapacitated. Yes. And your dad abandoned, and this is your words, yes. abandoned the family. He went to France, then to Canada. Now, you were four. How aware were you of all of this drama surrounding you? Well, it was really difficult for me because we lost our apartment in Madrid. Yeah. And then we had to move with my grandmother in uh, Luque, Cordoba, which is in the south region of yeah. Andalusia in Spain. Yeah. And for me, it was a very difficult uh, situation because um, my mother, she couldn't have my brother and myself That's being right. paralyzed. And uh, she went to the local priest at that time in Spain. The priest uh, was yeah. a, a very important figure in the town. And uh, I became, when I was five years old, usually six when you go into, yeah. uh, I went with the nuns in a, in a, a school. Uh, where so you went to a convent? We, uh, I nuns. went to a convent for nuns uh -huh. until uh, when I was uh, 10 years old, 11. Yeah, because you, you got your education uh, in a seminary. Seminary, uh, uh, in both seminaries. Like uh, I did the um, secondary schooling also at the seminary yeah. in the north of Spain. You wanted to be a priest? Well, that was the wish of my mother, you know. Yeah. The traditional families over there is like uh, if you have a priest in the family, it's probably <laughs> a safe way to go to heaven. <laughs> <laughs> also, another child would, could become a lawyer or a doctor. That yeah. was, but it was the only pos uh, possibility for me to have an education because um, at that time Franco was in power. Yeah, and um, they were looking for priests. Then Franco was a, a very Catholic person. He, he was. was, apart from him. Apart from being a dictator. A dictator. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, to be honest with you, I remember when I became in the seminary in the secondary school, in the secondary education, yeah. that the priest used to say, it's so important to be a priest that even Franco kneels before confession. Oh. So that was the traditional. For me, anybody who wanted to become a priest, and also when you were the son of an immigrant, 
Remember that in uh, Spain at that time, we had the civil war between 30 and 1936 right. and 1939. So we depend a lot in the Western Union, people sending money from Mexico yeah. and Latin America yeah. and so forth. Yeah. And for me, it was um, um, an experience to, to, to see that uh, I, even though I had parents, I was an orphan because I couldn't see my mother only three times a year. And my father, I came to see him when I came to Canada. Yeah, the, so you didn't become a priest. Why not? No. First of all, I didn't find God in the, in the, in the, in the, <laughs> in seminary. the seminary. Uh, there were times when I questioned myself, and I even questioned my mother, if you think it's so important to become a priest, you should have become a nun. We were joking. Yeah, you know, yeah. This uh, son and yeah. mother conversation. And I study, like in the seminar, you study the Old Testament, the New Testament. And, and my knowledge of Jesus is not the one that uh, traditionally we know. I didn't think that uh, being in a convent is the way to help God. I, I believe that we are here on earth to contribute to the work of the Creator. Mm -hmm. And when you study Jesus Christ... He didn't really preach it in a church. He mm -hmm. was the church. He was going to the people. Yeah. And here in the uh, Catholic um, church, we're supposed to go to church to see God. If you need to go to church to see God, I, I don't think you can enter heaven. I realized that I, I, there were so many needs within myself and my family. I felt an orphan with parents. That an I, orphan with parents? Uh, yes, because I was. And remember that uh, we have the, the three wise men instead of Papa Noel in January the 6th. <laughs> when everybody had presents, I didn't yeah. have presents. When I used to go in town to holiday, uh, to, I mean, to, uh, during the holidays, and I used to see people with their parents, I only had a mother. So, uh, yeah. You so, were, you, you in, uh, in the seminary, you had a rethink of your beliefs. Oh, yes. Uh, and you probably became less religious and more... Wow, well, I used to question God every day of my life. Yeah. I mean, I, I became more confused there than... Yeah. Uh, but you also became more spiritual. A spiritual, yes. At, I, at, I acquired yeah. many knowledge that... Uh, yeah. uh, there was a moment in my life that I have to confess, which I always regret, that I used to tell the spiritual father, if God created the world, who created God? And, and yeah. that was a question that I, yeah. I really... Uh, yeah. Today, I am wondering whether I went a, fair to, uh, a bit too far. I was going to ask you a, a larger question, which has to do with, with this family situation that you went through from age four. Yeah. Uh, your seminary experience, and we already know some of the effect of, of, of that experience, uh, the, the dictatorial regime. Yes. In the end, yes. uh, and before you came to Canada, what was your view of the world with all these experiences? Did you have a sort of a, a view of the world and your place in it? Well, uh, it was difficult for me to understand why there were kids dying of hunger in Africa, mm -hmm. why there were people that um, I was influenced into that. They believe that if you're a Catholic, you go to heaven. And, 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 and I started thinking that there's no way there is only one religion to see God, mm -hmm. that we're all human beings created by God. And I could not understand that my, my way to continue believing in God was mm -hmm. through the seminary. Yeah. And, the, and, and, and I was not aware that... Uh, being a Catholic was the only way to, for salvation. You were trying to find other way. explanations, That's other right. ways. And uh, everything in the Catholic Church at that point, yeah. and probably still today, everything that is not explainable and you cannot explain is a mystery. Yeah. What about the regime, the, the dictatorial regime? Oh, that was what awful. Did, what did that do? That made me think that, you know, I was hoping to grow up and go into the world to explore if there was an answer to all my questions. Yeah. Because I couldn't find them there. And it was very difficult for me.
to follow that regime. Did you become curious about other regimes? And Well, I, especially I used to be, you know, the fact that um, being a prince, you could not marry. I, I like women. I like women a lot. Yeah. The most uh, important people in my life have been three women. My grandmother, my mother, and my wife. Mm -hmm. And I adore uh, women, to be honest with you. And I also became aware that um, I wanted to be married one day. I wanted to have children. And uh, that was out of the question. But said. not under that regime. No, I, guess. I can't. No. You couldn't. You couldn't. Well, in 73, you had a chance to explore other worlds. You came to Canada. And when I read your biography, yes. I um, honestly chuckled a little bit because of the circumstances. Yes. Now, your father, who was in Canada at the time, in 73, right? Yeah. He uh, sent for your brother, yes, your older brother. But your older brother got cold feet and he really didn't want to come. Yes. So you... My good man, you yes. replaced your brother's first name on the air ticket. Yes. And you came instead. Well, at that time, they, <laughs> they, there were no computers and so forth. <laughs> so there was the initial in the ticket. Yeah. G as Guillermo. <laughs> and I put an F and the last name Valadares. And that's how I came to, to meet okay. my father. I can picture this scene at the airport. You well, arrive. Yes. Your father didn't run. Recognize you. He hadn't seen you since age what? Age four? Age four. Uh, it was um, immigration who said, this is your father and this is your son. It reminded me of a <laughs> passage in the, in the Bible when they, during the crucifixion of yeah. Jesus Christ. Yeah. When he looks at Mary, yeah. the mother, and says, yeah. John, yeah. this is your mother and this is your son. So uh, it was... Um, did, did your father know right there and then that... He had sponsored the wrong son. Well, he didn't find out until we went on our way back home. Oh, you didn't tell him? No, I didn't tell him. That is so interesting. So you change a lot. Yeah. I understand you, you uh, lived with him for three months. Three months. And, and then what happened? You that left. was World War Three uh, because I started asking too many questions. Oh. I questioned him. How come you left us in Spain, my mother became paralyzed, you fled, and, and, and it was a very difficult discussion there because he said that uh, I wish the day you were born you would have not been born. It came to a, a very tragical moment where he told me to get out from the house. I got out from the house. We used to live on Palmerston and Dundas. That's right. And you went to live uh, with a friend? With a, um, a, one of his friends used to have a rooming house. And um, I asked for, I had my, my luggage, and I say, Antonio, will you please hold this? And I went to University Avenue to immigration because I wanted to go back to Spain. You wanted to go back? And yes, I wanted to go back. And then at the same time, I say, and what am I going to say to my mother? So I mean, Richard, Because there was no explanation from your dad that satisfied you, right? No, no, no. I couldn't. I was frustrated. I grew up frustrated. I could not understand yeah. many things that happened in life and at the moment. But you went on not only to survive, but to thrive in this community of ours. Uh, you became a, a, a power of sorts, starting with your journalistic Yes. Uh, experience, uh, more than an experience, you were there for four years with uh, um, a Spanish language newspaper called Correo Hispano Americano. Americano. Yes. You were, how did you become a journalist? Well, in, at the seminary, I used to be a poet. I used to write poems. And um, it's funny because when we were living on Crawford and Dundas, and there were a lot of Portuguese people. Yeah. At that time, and yeah. Italians. Yeah. Not many Spanish speaking people. And I remember that I used to um, teach uh, math to the university students here. 
And I became involved mainly in the Portuguese community, yeah, which yeah. I still adore. Portuguese yeah. community, I have a lot of respect, especially for the Portuguese yeah. community. Yeah. And um, I became involved in the Spanish media because there was a newspaper called Correo Hispanoamericano that gave me an opportunity to write poems. Ah. To publish, I published about. A, and you did, but I you did. also covered a lot of events in the well, Hispanic community, right? Throughout that, what I develop is uh, Actualidad Social Hispana, which means a, a, a page. I started with a page. I asked the, the publisher with current affairs. Current affairs. Yeah. If I could yeah. do a current affair page in the community. Yeah. Now. You were there with the newspaper from 74 to 78, but I, in the meantime, you yeah. got married to yes. Marina. Marina, yes. Yeah. Here, here in... Yes. I was covering, during my career, there was the yeah. Caravan Festival. You know, if you remember the Caravan Pavilions. That's right. And um, my wife was, uh, my brother-in-law was in charge of the Colombian Pavilion. And I went to cover the Spanish pavilion. There were the Seville, the Madrid, and also the Colombian. There were three pavilions. That's there. right. And I met my wife at the entrance. She was <laughs> the ticket holder. And that's, the rest is history. Eh? Yes, and the rest is history. Yes. In 78, your career took a huge turn, I think. You started working for uh, then uh, uh, Alderman, Tonio. Now it's a counselor, yes. uh, Tony Utonio, yes. and you were with him as an executive assistant yes. for 10 years. Yeah, but I have to tell you there that uh, that was a beautiful experience. And, and uh, I with used Tony, to have... With Tony? With Tony. Of Correo, course, yeah. Our office was uh, located on, on Dover Current College, 943 Dover uh, College. Antonio Donahue, I don't know if you remember at that time, Ben Gris died, passed away as a counselor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tony had lost for mayor the year before, I believe, or two, and there was a by-election. So Tony knocked on my door to put a sign in my yeah. office. While he was with me putting the sign in, in, inside my office, there were Portuguese and Italian people in there. Hey, Tony, yeah, Tony, yeah, you're famous yeah. here and there. And Tony could not speak Italian or Portuguese, being an Irish. That's right. That's right. So I came out and I translated for him. And Tony said, Fernando, you, you speak uh, Italian and Portuguese, yeah. sir? It's similar. And right up to then, uh, Tony asked me if I could accompany him yeah. after work to yeah. knock on doors to translate for him. And that's how it started. And that's how it started. It was well, uh, I, I, rem I remember, yes. Fernando, that you sort of became the eyes and ears of Tony Donio. You were pretty well everywhere. And I think you were probably as well known yes. as, as he was. Now, if you were to pick one, one thing that you did with him, the one that sticks to your mind, the one that you got more involved in, what would that be? Uh, was it your experience with the ethnic communities? Was it going to events? Was it speaking on his behalf? What was it? Well, to be honest with you, I did not, uh, when Antonio Donahue approached me and we won the campaign, and I said we won because I, won. I became a big part in, in that campaign. Remember the, the demographics of the war at that time yeah. were mainly Portuguese, Italians. And Italian, yeah. And then there was the... Uh, so would you say that campaigning was... was campaigning uh, it became for me a, 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 an eye-opener because yeah. I started meeting different people. That's right. Eating different uh, foods. Uh, a world opened to me yeah. that it was yeah. unknown. Yeah. And Tony said to me, why don't you become my assistant and I said, but me not speak English very well. <laughs> and you know what Tony said? Fernando, I speak English, but I cannot communicate with the community the way you do. Yeah. I need you not to speak English. Yeah, interesting. To, that was the, um, and then it, it became a very good experience at an early right. age. That's right, a very intense experience. In 88, you left yes. uh, this, why? 
Well, I became more, um, I didn't see myself uh, having a future in politics no. because I would have liked to work more for the Hispanic community. Yeah. And there were not too many Hispanic And you never thought of becoming a politician yourself? No. No, because... No? Because um, you could accomplish things as a politician as well. Uh, it was very difficult for me because uh, you really have to have a community base. Oh, yes. And I didn't have Which it. Which you didn't. You know, um, and, do you still maintain uh, contact with Tony? Always. He's the godfather of my son, Jose, the yeah. elders. And we always... Uh, Is he well? No, he was in palliative care, as we are talking today. Um, I was told about three weeks ago. Palliative care? Yes. Um, and yeah. he's around 85 now. So yeah. He's I don't 85. Know. Oh, that's but, too bad. Uh, to me, Tony was the figure of the father that he didn't have. That you didn't have. And we continue. And every time I had a problem or something, that I, I, I always can come. He was there to help. Now, after your experience with political activity, yeah. uh, you went back to the newspaper business, yes. and then some. First, from 87 to 95, for eight years, you were the editor and publisher of Tiempo. Tiempo newspaper. And, uh, which was a monthly publication? What, that one was a monthly. The Correo was a weekly one. Yeah. Uh, so you went back to, to becoming a journalist, but you were doing other things. Uh, well, uh, that, uh, that I think we, um, when I was at City Hall in 1980, after knowing the communities that I was involved with in the in the war, yeah, um, I t I asked Tony. I said, Tony, I would like to unify all the Spanish-speaking countries into one umbrella. Uh. And Tony is really the the one that uh, opened the door for me. And what I am today, I owe it to him. This was a very ambitious uh, thinking yes, on your part. Yes, because people were saying to me that I was crazy. They said, Simon Bolivar, the liberator of America, yeah, yeah. only managed to put together six countries. <laughs> and you want to put together 20 the different countries. Of... So I said, you know what? Um, our community is a majority of minorities. Yeah. So if we unite under one umbrella. Yeah. yeah. And that's when we founded with Tony Las Flores Foundation. That's right. We'll talk about it a little later. Yes. Uh, in 1990, you were the coordinator of CC to Spain. So you got involved in the tourism uh, business as well? Well, the Canadian National Exhibition, yeah. uh, you remember, they used to have a feature country. That's right. And I was called to coordinate the efforts between Canada and Spain, and I coordinated the pavilion for. Yeah, for you also team. got involved on a on a TV show yes. uh, that Say was C. related to the Say C to Spain. Say C to Spain, yeah, Say C Television on uh, City TV. We yeah. did about 40, 48 programs, uh, and then I became a radio producer. Yeah, that's and, right. Um, now we're going to talk about uh, two shows that that I, from what I've seen, and I've seen some video. Uh, first of all, the Toronto Fiesta Productions is, is a company that, that I think spawned the, the, uh, the uh, Hispanic Fiesta. Hispanic Fiesta uh, was born after the, uh, 1982. In 1981, we found the Las Flores. And, and, um, we oh, told it, yeah, that's we right. Told that's we were right. saying, how can we raise money? And we decided to do a festival uniting all the 20 different countries, which, by the way, uh, years later, I was interviewed by the voice of um, the Americas in, wa in Washington. Yeah. And Hispanic Fiesta is still today, it was the only co uh, festival that unites 20 different countries. Because in New York, you have um, the, the Hispanic Parade, uh, you have the 20th of July for the Colombians, but you don't have a festival that unites all the communities. So and this we, is it. And this is it. Yeah. And I, for 38 years, yeah. I produce yeah. Hispanic Fiesta. I'm told that, that it's still going on today? No, we st I stopped it in 2018. 18? Due to the pandemic or no? No, it was, uh, I wanted to take a break. It ran its course, but 
for 36 years. 38 years. 38, I'm told that this international Hispanic fiesta, fiesta was the largest cultural undertaking for the Hispanic in community Canada. in Canada. Yes, sir. That's quite a, a big thing. Tell me a little bit about a typical year. Uh, it attracted all kinds of entertainers and cultural events and, and things? Yes, we had um, one of the most, uh, I think, uh, I'm very proud of, of, of some of my work. Yeah. Because um, in, uh, in 1980, uh, when our community was really getting a little bit strong. I wanted to go to Harbor Front to, to present the Spanish music. And it was a type of avant-garde situation where the Spanish music was unknown here. The Spanish uh, gastronomic uh, foods was not really much known apart from the Spanish seafood rice and not even the tacos were present. <laughs> But what I noticed is that after Hispanic Fiesta started, I found out that too many Canadians who used to go and they still go to Cuba, Latin America, mm -hmm. especially the Dominican Republic and Mexico, our Latin culture or Spanish culture is very well known and loved. And I would say Hispanic culture in general is one of the most richest in the world because yes. it represents 20 different countries. But one of the things that I found out is that after Hispanic Fiesta, where you see all the performance, folklore, the tango, mariachi, flamenco, Andean music, uh, salsa, whatever. Yeah. All the other festivals within Toronto started incorporating in their street festivals some of the features the Latin rhythms <laughs> oh, the, yeah. the foods so I think that I'm very proud to have been been able to put our community yeah. and, and all the those elements in, you, in the picture you, you started almost like a movement yes it, uh, it was a movement yeah you should be proud of, of that as you should be proud of um, uh, of being the founder in 1981 of Las Flores Charitable Foundation, yes, which assists new Hispanic immigrants to adjust to life in Canada, right? Yes. Uh, and then in 2018, you became general managers of Las Flores Nonprofit Housing Corporation. So there is a building now. There is a building. Uh, that what what is the building for? The building, uh, our um, goal was at the time when I was at City Hall. Yeah. to have a senior's building, thinking about the future. People get old and so forth. The government programs were not there for that. So we have, our building became approved in 1990 yeah. as a family mix. And I managed to have, at that time, built um, 134 units. Yeah. On um, Dora Avenue, 10 Dora Avenue, yeah. Villa Las Flores. And uh, there was a debate with the government because I wanted to have mainly one bedrooms. And they uh -huh. were saying, why so many one bedrooms? I was also trying to get into the seniors, the people yeah, getting yeah, there. Yeah. And we have 81 bedrooms, 47 two bedrooms, and six three bedrooms. And we have over 80 people, right? Who yeah. are maybe, uh, this is for needy families? Or? Needy families. No, it's 65% it's, um, is um, subsidized. And uh, it's a private nonprofit. That's right. And 35% is market. Yeah. So this Las Flores project is one of your crowns, <laughs> I, yes. would, I would think. But you've also been involved in other causes uh, that have to do with um, fundraising. Yes. Uh, through the Red Cross and various churches to assist victims of natural disasters like earthquakes Probably in Mexico. Yes, in Mexico, Mexico, Salvador, Ecuador, Chile, Colombia, Colombia the Colombia, the Mountain Lights, yeah. and, and the earthquake in Popayán. You've also spearheaded a fundraising campaign to bring Spanish and Latin American children. Yes. Uh, At that time. To uh, receive specialized medical treatment. This was when you had the radio. 
right? Uh, I had a radio also. I was working at City Hall because yeah, I was. You did the radio thon. The yeah. most mu multitasking is yeah. uh, my last name should be multitasking, <laughs> and um, there were you know how situations start. A child from Argentina, the parents yeah. call saying the only the, there is a doctor a chick kids in Toronto that he can uh, cure my son. That's the only hope. So I took into uh, these kids that were coming, that were from Latin America, even one from Spain, where the only hope for survival for them was the sick kid hospital. Yeah. Some of them through the Herbie Foundation and some of the other ones. Oh, the Herbie Foundation, yeah. Yes. Yeah, I, I'm familiar with that. And um, we did fundraising with the Spanish media. I have to say that the Spanish media cooperated even on Chin Radio that the uh, Johnny Lombardi cooperated uh, yeah. a lot, opening to yeah. the Portuguese and Italian communities to, to help. Yeah. Uh, now, when we were talking on the phone to prepare for this interview, I asked you to send me some pictures of awards because you have so many awards. Oh, I have But you're awards. such a modest guy. I never got those pictures. Okay, Maybe I, you can I send will. them to me. Yes, I will. Because there is a huge list yes. of awards. I picked... Three or four here, uh, volunteer award from the province of Ontario, citation yeah. from the Ontario Minister of Citizenship and Culture. Yes. This is all to do with your involvement in the community yeah, and right. multicultural um, groups. Uh, citation from the government of Spain. Yes. This was because of your tourist uh, your tourism connection, I guess, the tourist uh, office of Spain. Yes, and also the promotion of Spain in That's Canada. That's right. Uh, and then you have a citation from Hispanic Canadian Multicultural Association for the development of the Hispanic culture in Canada. Uh, very appropriate. Citation from the Hispanic Press Association of Canada. So you have these awards, these citations, covering a multitude of tasks that you took. Yes, and many trophies about yeah. the, the best festival. The, uh, also, I'm the founder with Lenny Lombardi and Lido Cilelli of the Taste of Lero Italy yeah. and the Corso Italia Festival yeah. with uh, Lido. Yeah. But in, in heavily my community, see, one of the, I have about 75 citations and, and, uh, and, and awards. Oh, send, send me half a dozen. The problem is <laughs> that my wife, and to be honest with you, I hide them because she said, this is to clean, more dust to clean. <laughs> and, and my office in our home is full of them and many yeah. of them are in archives. <laughs> Without the meaning any of your, or of your awards, is there one that speaks to you a little more, that goes to your heart? I think the one that really speaks to me, there are two, I would say. Yeah. It says Queen Centennial um, oh, Citation yeah. from the City of Toronto, yeah, because yeah, it was yeah. part of that. I have it here on the list, yeah. Okay. And also the one from, I have the tower of, uh, a Roman tower in silver from the government of Spain. For the the, the, the uh, all the work that I did for Spain in Canada, yeah, and um, those are two of the ones that really. But you know, yeah. the first one makes you excited. The second one, but when you have so many, yeah. I want, I'm the top choice of one. Uh, I have three of them. Yeah, and uh, but it comes to yeah. a point where you said, you know, allow other people. To, yeah. Because, you well, you also met throughout your career a lot of interesting people, well known, famous people. Um, I met Mohammed Ali in Toronto, Henry Kissinger, the King of Spain, the Queen of England. When I was part yeah. of the protocol, yeah, um, we have a picture here of you interviewing a, a royal yeah, from Spain, right? The daughter, uh, yes, Princess Cristina, yeah, the daughter of the King of Spain. Of That's the, right. The the old kid, the previous kid. Now it's his son is the kid. Yeah. Okay. You didn't just work. You you did a little bit of uh, stuff for yourself. You you used to play soccer. I used to play soccer. Uh, you did some traveling. You went to Cuba, Colombia, Mexico, USA, yeah. and I read about um, uh, your trip to Spain, I don't know if it was just one or more, but in 1990, yes. you visited your mother in Spain and you told me you had a very emotional get-together with her. 
How so? Well, that, uh, that was um, in 1990 when I was, um, I was um, coordinating the CC to Spain presence at the Canadian National Exhibition. Yeah. For three months, I was a week in Spain, two weeks in Toronto from May to August. So in one of those um, trips, I went to see my. I, I always went to see my mother one day out of my schedule. That's I, right. I took um, every time I went, and I was seeing my my, my mother almost every three uh, every three weeks. Yeah. During that period. Yeah. And she said to me, uh, Fernando, your brother, you know, is becoming a pain. Your brother is here. Your brother is. I don't like the, the way he treats me. And um, I remember telling my mother, Mom, when I was five years old, you sent me to a convent. Yeah. And then you sent me to the seminary. And I am 6,000 kilometers away. And I'm going to say what uh, Jesus told his mother, you know, Mom, there is your son. Son, there is your mother. And she said to me, Fernando, I did what I thought it was the best for you. And I told my mother, and she started crying. And, and I started crying too. I said, Mom, you made a mistake. And it was really bad because after that, we became even closer. I felt So that. this meeting led to a sort of reconciliation with your yes. mom. Because I, I uh. blamed my mother thinking that because of her, I had to go away. And I said, I cannot never, ever love the way he does yeah. because I feel empty. I guess to reconcile, you had to come to some kind of understanding That's right. of, of, of your, and acceptance of what your mom had done. That's right. Even though it was a mistake, but you did understand that maybe under the circumstances she had no choice. I don't know. But well, you, you reconciled, right? I reconciled, and at the same time, I thought about God, and I said, you know, God doesn't give you what you want, but what you need. Yeah. And then I, I said, my mother did what she thought I need. Yeah. And what I re told her is, you know, I'm sorry, but I wanted to be with you. Yeah. Did you ever regret not becoming a priest? No. Nope. I had my second thoughts, and I remember the spiritual father, when I was talking to him and saying, I, am not, I don't belong to this. I don't belong to this. And he said to me, Fernando, one day you will find God. And I, to be honest with you, mm -hmm. and this is what I'm very grateful to Tony Donahue, yeah. serving people at City Hall yeah. was that chance. Yeah. Now... We have a picture here of you dressed as a priest. Yes. Can you explain it? <laughs> there was a movie, Little Brother. Oh. They, we we're talking about Kennedy and um, Chavez yeah. in that era when Kennedy was running for president. Yeah. And it was filmed in Niagara. And so this is, you were a character in a movie. Yes. <laughs> and I, my, my role was to give communion to Chavez and Kennedy. Yeah. And this was in Niagara on the lake. Very good. And um, so, on top of everything, you're an actor as well. I became a priest, <laughs> and you became a priest. I became a priest for for that particular for movie. Very good. I just have one more question. Unfortunately, you know how it is on television. Yes. In television, we kind of have to come to an end yes. because it's been so nice to talk to you, and we could spend hours uh, talking about your very very illustrious uh, life. But uh, your dream uh, was to unite all Spanish-speaking communities. Yeah. Um, and, and a lot of people think that Spanish-speaking communities are just one. No, they're many, no. made up of many nations, many, many 20, countries. 20 of them. How 20, many? 20. <laughs> 20. And if we were to count the United States, the United States of America yeah. is the second largest Spanish country in the world. With mm -hmm. 65 That's million right. people. Now, that was, you wish was to unite these communities in Toronto into one. Do you feel you accomplished this or in, in some way? I think I have accomplished not the unification as such, but yes, the proliferation of the cultures. 
of the food and the music. Because, as you know, we are people from 20 different countries with internal and regional and national problems. Yeah. And also living the memory of 500 years of the conquistadors coming into America. That's right. So I took the politics out of it. Yeah. And what I use for that is the Spanish language. Yeah. You probably have helped these communities adapt better to Canada by, by um, uh, integrating their cultural way of life into mainstream? Yeah. Is it, there is an element of helping them integrate, well, isn't there? My, my speech and it's always been, if we go as Mexicans, Colombians, or Spanish, or, or Dominican, we are a ma majority of minorities. Mm -hmm. But if we go as one community, the Hispanic community, yeah. Yeah. over one million people in Canada, that we contribute to the Canadian society, we should be proud, and I always emphasize this, yeah. we are all Canadians of different origins. We have to see ourselves as Canadians. Yeah. Because the first generation stick to the roots. Yes. But our second and third generation is more a fusion. Yeah. So therefore, be proud of your roots, but at the same time, be proud to be a Canadian of Portuguese origin, Spanish origin. And I think that that is, is, uh, is working very well now with the second and third generation. We spoke of your many accomplishments, but we, we um, left the best one for the end. Yeah. I understand you just became a grandfather. Yes, I <laughs> that's a very... Congratulations. Very, thank you. Very Is it a boy or a girl? It's a girl. A girl. And uh, Juliana Marina ah. Valladares. And uh, it's the, I have two kids, but I, I, I was looking for a, a girl. And I think God gave you got me it. a girl. I got it. I am very proud. And I hope I will see her grow and uh, give her what I did have. That's right. Uh, it's been a real pleasure to talk to you. Thank you for, for the time. Thank you for sharing yes. your magnificent uh, life uh, in the community. And um, hopefully we'll talk soon. I again. hope to see you again, you know, and uh, hope we stay in, chat, in, in, in touch. In touch, thank for you. sure. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you, sir. And thank you very much to our viewers for being with us. Until next time, thank you.